So we should learn to talk about God's power. You see, the more you talk about God's power, the more you see the power of God in manifestation. It's like the power of confession. We've talked about it. The more you talk about love, the more you say, I love you to your spouse, to people and profess love, the more it manifests in your life in Jesus' name. The more you also confess faith. Hallelujah. You confess that, you know, the, the more your faith grows. And so the Bible says they shall talk of your power. Instead of us talking about things not being possible, instead of us talking about what the devil is doing, let's talk about what God is doing. Let's talk about what God can do. Let's talk about what God has done and what he can do. Sort of talking about how the devil is taking everybody, how the devil is doing this and the devil is doing that. Let's talk about what God is doing. Let's talk about what God can do. Let's talk about what he has done and what he wants to do. Can someone say amen? And the more we talk about that, the bigger it grows on our inside. Like I said to us, the Bible tells us that all those idols, they are nothing. But why do we see them do stuff? Because the worshippers of them are the ones giving them the power they have. Because they carry their consciousness when they talk about their idols, they talk about what the idols can do. They believe so much in those idols. Is that not true? And then people, even Christians, now believe more in the power of those things than in the power of God. That's why we believe more in what the devil can do than what God can do. But we have to start, start, we have to start talking about the power of God. Can someone say amen? Psalm 145, 10 to 13, all your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. And talk of your power. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts. We must make known to the sons of men the mighty acts of God. And the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And your dominion endures throughout all generations. In Psalm 62 verse 11, he said, God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, I have heard this, that power belongs to who? To God. And so we're looking at the power of God. You said, number one, he has the power to remove and raise up kings. Can somebody say amen? Number two, the power to kill and to make alive. Number three, the power to show mercy. Number four, the power to forgive. Can someone say the power to forgive? Let me say something about the power to show mercy, just to link these two scriptures. You know, the base text is um, that Psalm 62 that says, God has spoken once, twice, have I heard that power belongs to God. That's Psalm 62 verse 11. If you go to verse 12, it says, also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. It says power belongs to God, but to that same God belongs mercy. And when I thought about that, because I want to quickly say some things on that and we move on. I remember David, when he, when he you know, carried out that census and God was so angry. God was so angry with him and sent a prophet to him, prophet God. And said, go and tell David that I'm so angry and I'm giving him three options of punishments to choose from. And then, let's take it, I want to read quickly from 2 Samuel 24, 14 to 16. And David said to God, that is the prophet, I'm in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a plague. Who sent the plague? Who sent it? That's what I was talking about under the sovereignty of God. This is not to say that every plague you see, every evil you see is from the Lord. But if the Bible says the Lord sent something, the Lord sent it. The Lord sent a plague upon Israel. Don't, we don't care about where he got it from. Just focus on the fact that he sent it. You see, I like God. If he did something, we'll say I didn't do it. He said, when I shut up heaven... <laughs> And there's no rain. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Amen. And seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. I will hear from heaven. That's what you should bother yourself with. Where did he get it from? I don't know where he got the templates from. 
But he said, I will not afflict you with any of those plagues that afflicted them within Egypt. That's what he said. I mean, God will come out with his chest and say, I did it. <laughs> Amen. You are the one trying to, you know, make God, you know, look like somebody who just goes around like a father Christmas from the North Pole. Can somebody say amen? You must know how to relate with this God. And know that God is for you and not against you. And that God cares about you. Praise the Lord. Now listen, he said, I'm in great distress. Please let me fall into that. So verse 15, so the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning to the appointed time. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. And when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusites. Amen. Do you get it? In Joel chapter 2, 11 to 14, the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart and your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Can you see? So power belongs to God, but mercy also belongs to God. Some people have power, but they don't have mercy. Slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows, verse 14, if he would turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Can somebody say amen? amen. And then in Jonah chapter 3, 4 to 10. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh which shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Can someone say power belongs to God? Also to God belongs mercy. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his, this, his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? God said, I sought for a man that will stand in the gap so I don't pour out my indignation. Verse 10, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, if my people who are called by my name. And God relented from the disaster that he has said he will bring upon them and he did not do it. Praise the Lord. So God has a power to show mercy. Power belongs to God. Also mercy belongs to God. That's why David said, I'd rather fall into the hands of God because God has mercy. Amen. So what's the next one? The power to forgive. What's the next one? The power to do good. Amen. That's number five. The number six. The power to heal. Our God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen, with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing. So the power to heal. The number, the power to deliver, rescue, and save. That was where we stopped the last time on Sunday. Is that not true? And we looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Amen. And then Daniel delivered from the lion's den. That's in uh, Daniel chapter 6, 16 to 22. Then Peter, we talked about Peter. We referred to Peter, delivered from the prison, Acts 12, 11. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from the expectation of the Jewish people. Let's go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34 from verse 4.
I saw the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. From some of them, all. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. Verse 6. This poor man cried out. Either you are financially poor or emotionally poor or spiritually poor. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For this is the kingdom of heaven. The New Living Translation says, blessed are those who realize their need for God. The poor, those who realize their need for God. So this poor man cried out, either you are emotionally poor, financially poor, physically poor, <laughs> mentally poor. As long as you realize your need for God. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. Don't forget that the word save is deliver. Deliver, rescue, save. Amen. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him, and delivers them. Can you see fear him again? And delivers them. Verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their cry. Verse 17. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Verse 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. In Psalm 51, the psalmist said a broken heart, a contrite spirit, God will not despise. When your heart is broken before the Lord, broken because of what you've done, broken because of a wrong or something, like in Psalm 51, after David sinned with Bathsheba, he said a contrite heart, a broken heart, a remorseful heart, God will not despise. God says in, somewhere in, in Isaiah that one who trembles at his word, that when you hear the word of God, that word of God, you tremble at the word of God, like David. So he said, um, verse 18 again, Psalm 34, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and save such as have a contrite spirit. Verse 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. It is not the wicked or the unrighteous now, the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. And that translation says, the righteous may have many afflictions. I like that. So the fact that you are righteous does not mean that you will not have troubles. Jesus said, in the world you have troubles. In James chapter 5, the Bible says, is anyone afflicted? Let him pray. That has to do with having troubles. Amen. Many are the troubles, the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers them out of some of them, all of them. The Lord will deliver you from all, out of all your afflictions. Out of all of them. All means all. If you're going to believe God's word and hold God to his word, you will see his salvation. Verse 20, he guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Your bones will not be broken in Jesus' name. Amen. In Psalm 35, verses 9 to 10. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. The Lord will deliver you. He said, yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Hallelujah. Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. The Lord will deliver you from any situation that is proven too strong for you. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope you have been blessed. Partner with us by helping us reach more people with this message across the globe. Call our office at plus 234-708-109-9229 or plus 4477-864-309. If you would like us to pray with you, call us or send us messages on WhatsApp 
at plus two three four seven zero eight one zero nine nine two two nine.